Uh, we are so glad that you're all here tonight, and I hope that uh, you learn a lot. You have a great time this evening. We are talking about a subject that I am very excited about, um, probably one that you've been thinking a lot about this last year, immune health, and one that I have found myself doing a ton of reading and research on, um, months and months of reading. So I'm kind of taking some of that and synthesizing it down tonight into this presentation. And I think you will be uh, very blessed. I will tell you this um, as we're kind of beginning here, there is a lot of science, scientific research that I will be referencing this evening. And I, when it comes to medical things, I think it's very important for people to be able to check things out for themselves, to go back to the sources because there can be a lot of things said about health out there that may not be scientifically backed up. So what well, you're gonna be getting um, tomorrow is an email that has links to all the references that are referred to tonight. So if I'm showing a video or if I am showing an article excerpt, you'll be able to go back and read up more on that, um, study it out more yourself and have that in your files too for reference for the future or maybe just pass on to somebody else. So that that was really important. So that's going to be uh, something you'll be receiving as well. So we have 35 people on so far and I am so excited about that. And I am looking forward to uh, sharing with you this evening. Um, before we be go any further, I just want to have a short prayer and just welcome God here to be with us. And then we'll have a couple of quick announcements and then we'll get into our presentation tonight. Dear God, I want to thank you so much for everyone who's able to be here tonight with me and our team and to be able to talk on this very important subject of immune health. Lord, you're the one who created our bodies and created our immune system. And you're the one that can teach us how it works and how we can take good care of it. So I ask, Lord, you bless this presentation and that it would be a real blessing to everybody here. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So we're talking about tonight home remedies for immune health. And as we begin, I want to make a disclaimer. Uh, while the information discussed in this presentation is based on medical research, and it's intended to provide general information, it doesn't replace professional medical care. So it's always wise to consult with your medical provider regarding your health, especially if you're sick or you have a health condition. And so I just want to make that clear. We're not here being doctors tonight saying this is what you should do. We don't know what your health situation is. Um, so that's why your physician is a good person to consult with about anything that we might share tonight. This is just some of the research that's coming out on different things related to immune health. So um, take the information down, study it out for yourself, talk with your doctor, and um, make your own health choices. So what is the immune system? The immune system is the body's defense system against disease causing organisms, viruses, bacteria, fungi, and any foreign invader. And God designed our immune system to detect these invaders, tag them for destruction, and then annihilate, annihilate them by using our white blood cells. Now, why is your immune system so important? Well, your immune system is the key to staying healthy and energized. When your immune system is working well, you'll feel vibrant and healthy. When it's stressed, overworked, or compromised, you're going to feel tired, achy, and you're going to be much more susceptible to viruses, colds, and getting sick. So a healthy immune system is the difference between sickness and vitality. It's the difference between feeling down and feeling great. It's the difference between being vulnerable to illness and disease and death or being hard to kill. So that tells us why our immune system is so very important. Now, even if you have a strong immune system, it doesn't mean you're never going to come down sick. But it does mean that when you do come down sick with something, that the duration of it and the severity of it is usually going to be lessened. And that's really important. 
So having a good immune system um, can make it so much better if you do um, come down sick. Now there are two types of immunity. There is the innate nonspecific immunity and there's the adaptive or specific immunity. So let me just briefly explain the difference between those. Your innate immunity is what you're born with. It's very strong, which is why babies often will develop a fever to fight off an illness. It's your first line of defense and it's non-selective, which means it attacks any invader, whatever it is. Your adaptive immunity is slower to respond. It can sometimes take a couple of days for it to start to like kick in. And it's highly specific. So that means that it targets it targets specific viruses, specific bacteria. And it's part of your immune system that learns over time. So that's why it's specific because it has this memory built into it. And it re is the one that responds to vaccines. Now, when I was trying to think about how the immune system works, this is an extremely complicated part of our body. And you could take years and a lifetime, I think, studying this topic out and still be trying to figure it out. Most of you probably have never had a degree in, in a nursing degree or a doctor degree. So you probably haven't spent a lot of time studying your immune system, which I really hadn't done a whole lot either. So something that helped me was a little video that you, may seem slightly childish because it's animated, but in the same way, it's fun and it helps to kind of show you how your immune system works. So I'm going to switch to our video about our immune system. So let me make this full screen. And we're gonna just watch this little video that's gonna explain how your immune system works. Every day we encounter a huge bacteria, viruses, and other disease-causing organisms. However, we don't fall ill every other day, which is due to our immune system, an army of cells that is always roaming our body, ready to ward off any attack. The immune system can be broadly divided into two parts, innate and adaptive immunity. Innate immunity, or nonspecific immunity, is the body's first natural defense to any intruder. This system doesn't care what it's killing. Its primary goal is to prevent any intruder from entering the body, and if it does enter, then the immune system neutralizes this intruder. It doesn't differentiate between one pathogen and another. The first component of this defensive system is our skin. Any organism trying to get into the body is stopped by the skin, our largest organ, which covers us. Secondly, there is the mucus lining of all our organs. The sticky, viscous fluid traps any pathogens trying to get past it. These are the two physical barriers. However, we also have chemical barriers, such as the lysozyme in the eyes or the acid in the stomach, which can kill pathogens trying to gain entry. The genitourinary tract and other places have their own normal flora or microbial community. These compete with pathogens for space and food and therefore also act as a barrier. The next line of defense is inflammation, which is done by mast cells. These cells are constantly searching for suspicious objects in the body. When they find something, they release a signal in the form of histamine molecules. These alert the body and blood is rushed to the problem area. This causes inflammation and also brings leukocytes or white blood cells, which are soldiers in our body's cellular army. Once they come, all hell breaks loose. Sometimes, however, the intruder may not be a germ, but rather a harmless thing like a dust particle. The body still causes a full immune reaction to this intruder, which is how allergic reactions occur. In the fortress of our body, the leukocytes are VIPs. They have an all-access pass to the body, except, of course, to the brain and spinal cord. Our leukocytes come in many types. Those that belong to the innate system are the phagocytes. These cells can either patrol your body, like the neutrophils, or they can stay in certain places and wait for their cue. Neutrophils are the most abundant cells. They patrol the body and can therefore get to a breach site very quickly. These cellular soldiers kill the infectious cell and then die, which leads to the formation of pus. 
there are also the big bad wolves, or the macrophages. These cells are like hungry, ravenous monsters who simply engulf unwanted pathogens. Instead of roaming freely in our blood, they are collected in certain places. These cells can consume about 100 pathogens before they die, but they can also detect our own cells that have gone rogue, such as cancer cells, and kill them too. Beyond that, we also have the natural killer cells. These cells can efficiently detect when our own cells have gone rogue or are infected with, say, a virus. NKCs detect a protein produced by normal cells called the major histocompatibility complex, or MHC. Basically, whenever a cell isn't normal, it stops producing this protein. The NKCs move around constantly, checking our cells for this type of deficiency. And when they find an abnormal cell, they simply bind to it, release chemicals, and destroy it. The last cells of our innate immune system are the dendritic cells. These are found in places that come in contact with the outside environment, such as the nose and lungs. They are the link between our innate and adaptive immune systems. They eat a pathogen and then carry information about it to our adaptive immune system cells. This information is produced and shared in the form of antigens. Antigens are the traces that pathogens leave behind. They are molecules found on the surface of pathogens that can be detected by our adaptive immune system for recognition. The dendritic cells pass on this information to our T cells. However, macrophages can also perform this function. Now, there is also the adaptive or acquired immune system. This system is more efficient as it can differentiate between different types of pathogens. It has two main components, T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes. T cells come into play when an infection has already occurred, thus bringing about the cell-mediated immune response. B cells join the fight when the pathogens have entered, but haven't yet caused any disease. This is called the humoral immune response. Some T cells take signals from the dendritic cells or macrophages and are thus called helper T cells. They perform two key tasks, forming effector T cells, which are basically cells that cycle through the body and call in the cavalry, namely other white blood cells. Helper T cells also form memory T cells, which keep a record of this antigen for future reference. Sometimes, some cells of our body know that they have lost the battle. They have become heavily infected with pathogens, so there is no hope left for them. At this point, the immune system brings out the cytotoxic T cells. These cells rush over and perform a mercy killing for the infected and dying cell. Furthermore, we have the B cells. They produce chemicals called antibodies, which fit on the antigens of pathogens, much like how a lock and key fit together. These antibodies crowd around a pathogen and act like tags. They signal the macrophages to come and kill the marked pathogen. B cells also produce memory B cells when they encounter an antigen. The B and T memory cells jointly maintain a record of all encountered infections and thus strengthen and solidify the body's immune response to these infections in the future. Our innate response is quicker, though nonspecific. It gets into action within hours and is pretty strong. However, when things get out of hand, the innate system calls for help from the acquired immune system. This system can take days to mount a response, but the next time we encounter that pathogen, it won't make us get sick. In short, every day that we spend being healthy is all thanks to our immune system, so it definitely deserves our respect. Okay, so what do you think of that presentation? I know it's a little bit uh, kitty, <laughs> but at the same time, I thought it was also very helpful in seeing how our immune system is actually working. Mm -hmm. And just kind of seeing things illustrated like that, it just shows, wow, there's a lot of things going on in your immune system you have no idea about most of the time. Well, probably none of the time, <laughs> unless you're sick, right? Now, let me, I guess I have to close that and move over here and then share my screen to show you Okay. Can you see the slides again? Yep. Yes. Okay. No, it's the video. It's the video. Okay. Well, let me let me close that. Not sure what's going on there, but don't want that blocking anybody.
I think it was your slide, Stacy. Was my slide? Okay. Yeah, it looks like the video. Oh yeah, yeah, you're right. Right. Okay. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so when I was thinking about the complexities of our immune system, this Bible verse came to my mind. I will praise you because I've been remarkably and wondrously made. Your works are wondrous, and I know this very well. This is Psalm 139, 14. It's just really amazing how complex our body immune system is and how God created it, and something that we're still learning a lot about. Now, in the presentation, you will remember that it talked about um, the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. We're really focusing tonight on the innate immune system. And the reason for that is because this is the part of your immune system that makes that initial attack. When we encounter a bacteria or a cold virus or COVID, this is the part of your immune system that needs to be really strong because it's the one that's first attacking that invader. And there are two parts of the immune, innate immune system I want us to look at a little closer because they're going to be mentioned more later. And the first is the interferons and the natural killer cells. So interferon, it says here, is the defense that interferes with viral replication. And natural killer cells are the lymphocyte-like cells that rupture virus-infected cells and cancer cells. So here explains a little bit more about those. Interferon interferes with viral replication. It enhances phagocyte activity of macrophages, so that's their ability to gobble up other things. It stimulates the production of antibodies. It enhances the killing power of your natural killer cells and cytotoxic T cells, and it slows cell division and tumor growth. So those are all really amazing things that your interferon is doing. Now, the other one was the natural killer cells. And this is the part of your innate immune system that targets cancerous and virally infected cells and kills them. Basically, it- A webinar on immune systems and staying like healthy during the pandemic. So let's look briefly at what happens to the innate immune system when someone gets COVID-19 virus. So to do this, I'm going to be showing you a short video clip by Dr. Roger Schwelt. He's a board certified in internal medicine, pulmonary disease, critical care, and sleep medicine. He's also an assistant professor of medicine at Loma Linda University. Now, in addition to working regularly with COVID patients, he has done some of the top research on COVID-19, and he has an entire YouTube channel that is called MedCram, M-E-D-C-R-A-M, and he um, has, shares a lot of his research in there. In this video clip I'm going to show you, this was shown at, on a program that was done by AWR360 Health, and it was on hydrothermal therapy in COVID, and we're going to be discussing that a little bit more um, as we go down. But he, in this video, is going to show the research that of why COVID-19 cripples the innate immune system, okay? So let me just pull this up for you. Okay. You see where it says cells of the immune system now? Yep. All yep. right. Let's go with this one. The natural killer cells, which are descendants of a lymphoid progenitor, lymphoid progenitor, but nevertheless, it's part of the innate immune system. And then these monocytes uh, that are part of the innate immune system. We're going to talk about that. So there was an article that was published out of a center of excellence in Thailand titled Immune Responses in COVID-19 and Potential Vaccines, Lessons Learned. And basically, the point of this uh, article was to compare the first SARS virus in 2002 with the one in 2012. That was MERS. And those are both coronaviruses. And to use the understanding of that in comparison to what's going on right now with SARS-CoV-2 and, and COVID-19. And in this article, they pointed out a number of interesting things. Number one, that an increase in neutrophils and a decrease in lymphocytes was very similar to the prior two infections. And this correlated with an increased chance of death. Um, they, it's well known that the first SARS virus and MERS both suppress 
the innate immune system. And that COVID-19, the current one, may dampen antiviral IFN responses resulting in uncontrolled viral replication. You know, that's something that we've seen a lot of is people just are infected for a long period of time and they just can't kill the virus and get better. So what's going on there? They, they definitely say that there's an issue with the innate immune system and that it's suppressed at first and then allowed to go into overdrive, causing potentially that cytokine storm. And I think this paragraph in the article uh, really says it. They say, based on the accumulated data for previous coronavirus infection, innate immune response plays a crucial role in protective or destructive responses and may open a window for immune intervention. SARS-CoV-2 probably induces a delayed type 1 IFN and long viral control in an early phase of infection. Individuals susceptible to COVID-19 are those with underlying diseases, including diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease. In addition, no severe cases were reported in the young children. This is at that time when innate immune response is highly effective. These facts strongly indicate that innate immune response is a critical factor for disease outcome. And we can see here, here's another paper that was published back in 2004 on the first SARS virus that notices that these natural killer cells are at a very low percentage in comparison to a regular bacterial infection. There's another paper that was published in Nature Medicine. This was recently published just last month that took a woman who was in China infected with COVID-19 and was hospitalized in Australia. They did an essential workup on her and noted that yes, her monocytes and natural killer cells were suppressed. So of course, this is not just news to us. There are several companies that have looked at the innate immunity of the body and have targeted this for cancer research. And now that they see a, a much bigger issue in terms of COVID-19, they're repurposing their technology for this. And there's a company that's looking at placental mesenchymal cells to have them derive into natural killer cells to see if that can fight the fight against uh, COVID-19. There was another uh, company out of Israel that is doing a small trial. They tried it in eight patients, again, using mesenchymal stromal cells from the placenta that will readily differentiate into natural killer cells. And they're finding, as it says here in this article, 100% survival rate. This was just published just a few days ago. Here's another one. This is a South Korean company that's looking at natural killer cells. So this seems to be the focus of where we are going. So in short summary on this section, I think a good working hypothesis would be that SARS-CoV-2 infection down-regulates innate immunity and that SARS-CoV-2 is allowed to progress because innate immunity is not strong enough. And that strengthening that innate immune system might be a place to stop COVID-19, especially in this very sensitive phase two. Uh, where not much is being done. Patients are being sent home from the hospital and asked to stay there and isolate until they get worse. Is there something that we can do in this very long stage, about seven days, it seems like on average? Okay, so I showing that little video to you because I thought that there was a lot of really great research there that is explaining what is happening with COVID in relationship to immunity, innate immunity. And don't want to show it like that. I want to show it like this. Okay. So in this um, video, one of the things that Dr. Roger Schwelt shared was this research that came out um, last year on what happens to the innate immune response when a person gets COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 and how it delays interferon. So we mentioned interferon earlier. Remember, that's the part of your innate immune system that interferes with viral replication, causing the virus to die within the cell. COVID-19 delays that interferon, which results in a loss of viral control in an early phase of infection. And then he ended with this, um, summary or hypothesis is that um, because the initial, initially uh, COVID is suppressing the innate immune system, we want to strengthen the innate immune system so it can fight the virus before it replicates so much that's creating that cytokine storm that results in people getting very, very sick and maybe need to be hospitalized and possibly even dying. So where are we going to turn <laughs> to get our innate immune system stronger. And this is where we come to the eight doctors of immune health. 
And we're gonna be spending the rest of our time looking through each one of these eight doctors. We are using the acronym New Start. Uh, we here at the New Beginnings Health Team believe that God wants to give us new beginnings or a new start on health. So these eight doctors are all free and they're all easily available without even needing a doctor's visit. And they do work. So let's discuss each one and how they can strengthen our immune system. The first one is nutrition. So what we eat determines whether or not our immune system is going to be strong and healthy and working at an optimal level or weak and ineffective. And a healthy immune system needs high quality food and regular <laughs> nourishment. So that does not mean the standard American diet, which I like to call the sad diet. The standard American diet is low on nutrients. It's high in sugar and refined carbohydrates and hydrogenated oils, which hurts your immune system. These types of foods add a lot of stress to the immune system and it, put it puts it at greater risk because it places your body in a state of inflammation. And this is one reason why obesity increases the risk for many chronic ailments and infectious diseases. So instead, we want to be eating immune boosting foods. And when I talk about immune boosting foods, I'm talking about like the the picture you're seeing there on the screen, like these are the kind of foods that are just like so good for us. So look there on the left, you have grapefruit and citrus that's full of vitamin C. Then you got broccoli, uh, which is a great source of vitamin C and, anti and antioxidants. Um, their spinach contains many essential nutrients and antioxidants, including flavonoids and carotenoids and vitamin C and vitamin E, all which help support your immune system. Um, you got flax seeds and and avocados, which are rich sources of omega-3 fatty acids, which reduce inflammation and boost the activity of white blood cells and B cells. You've got blueberries. Those contain the flavonoid anthocyanin, which has antioxidant properties that can boost your immunity. And then you've got almonds here, which are an excellent source of vitamin E and magnesium and fiber and manganese. And there was a study in 2010 um, by the Institute of Food Research in Norwich, England, that found that the skin of raw almonds improved white blood cells' ability to detect viruses and increase defense. So great food to eat, raw almonds. Now, when we're talking about immune boosting foods, we're thinking about foods that are high in antioxidants. These are things like fresh fruits, vegetables, herbs, and spices. Antioxidants remove harmful free radicals from the blood system. So free radicals are what damage your DNA and weaken your body's immune system. Uh, many chronic degenerative diseases such as cancer, Parkinson's, heart disease are caused by oxidative stress, which is caused by free radicals. So on this chart, there are an ORC score which is the oxygen radical absorbance capacity of the food. Basically what that is, is just a measurement of the antioxidant capacity of the food. So they take a bunch of, um, they take these foods and they like shoot them with a bunch of free radicals and they see how well the food handles and disarms those radicals. So that's how they get this ORC score. So some of the highest scores on this chart are dark chocolate at over 20,000. Now I know some of you are like saying, yay, I like that. I like my dark chocolate. Well, it's very high in antioxidants. So that's a really good thing. Um, elderberry, which we'll be talking about a little bit more later is at nearly 15,000. Um, turmeric is at 102,000 and oregano at 159,000. Um, so that's why you'll hear sometimes people taking oregano oil or turmeric and things uh, because of its high antioxidant ORC values. Now, another thing when you're talking about fruits and vegetables is flavonoids. So flavonoids are the plant-based defense compounds found naturally in many fruits and vegetables. Flavonoids protect the plant from harsh stresses like sunlight, wind, and rain. And when we eat plant-based foods, these antioxidant-rich compounds help our body ward off everyday toxins. 
There was a study in 2016 that noted that flavonoids play an essential role in the respiratory tract's immune defense system. Researchers found that people who ate foods that were rich in flavonoids were sorry, less likely to get an upper respiratory tract infection or the common cold than those who did not. So eating lots of fresh fruits and vegetables is a great way to boost your immune system and keep you from catching colds um, as easily. Now let's talk about some of the vitamins that we find in these fruits and vegetables. Vitamin C is probably one of the most well-known vitamin that we think of when we think of immunity. It's found in fruits like citrus, strawberries, or kiwis. It's found in vegetables like peppers, kale, broccoli, Brussels sprouts. Now, I was telling my husband this today, and, and he didn't know this, and you may not know it either, but one orange will provide 78% of your daily value for vitamin C. But a yellow bell pepper contains 152% of your daily value. V of vitamin C. That's twice as much as you're getting, you eat a yellow bell pepper versus an orange. But I think everybody thinks of oranges as like um, the greatest source of vitamin C. Now, what is vitamin C doing for our immune system? Well, it contributes to immune defense by supporting various cellular functions of both the innate and the adaptive immune system. It boosts the activity of those phagocytes, which are the immune cells that are swallowing up the harmful bacteria and other particles. And it promotes the growth and spread of lymphocytes, which is a type of immune cell that increases your circulating antibodies or those proteins that are attacking foreign or harmful substances in your body. In an analysis of 29 studies um, that include over 11,000 participants, they found that Supplementing with 200 milligrams or more of vitamin C did not necessarily reduce your risk of catching a cold, but it can reduce the cold's severity and duration. So taking vitamin C regularly as a supplement, it, as they found in this one study, which we will include in the handout you get, um, doesn't necessarily mean that it will keep you from getting sick, but you will have a shorter duration if you do. So it's very important if you do start to come down with some kind of infection or some kind of illness to start taking extra dosages of vitamin D. And this is because your body is using up, did I say vitamin D? I meant vitamin C. <laughs> it's because your body is using so much vitamin C um, to deal with the illness and you'll want to give it extra during this time. Here was a fascinating study that was published in Nutrients in 2019 that looked at vitamin C shortening the length of stay in the ICU. And it shortened their duration of people that were in the ICU on average by 8%. In three trials in which patients needed mechanical ventilation for over 24 hours, vitamin C shortened the duration of the mechanical ventilation by 18.2%. Now, this is a very fascinating um, paper, and you can look at this um, more when we send you the link to it. But yeah, showing that, now this was not related to COVID or anything like that, um, but it did show that vitamin C helped those that were in ICU to shorten their stay there and those who were on ventilation. Now, another important vitamin is vitamin B. And so we have vitamin B5, which promotes the production and release of antibodies from B cells and deficiency of vitamin B results in reduced levels of circulating antibodies. The folic acid deficiency can lead to a decrease in T cells and supports production of red blood cells which carry oxygen around the body. Vitamin B6 deficiency can impair T cell functioning and result in a decrease in blood lymphocyte counts. And vitamins B1 and B2 are important in normal antibody response. So you can just see that just taking these B vitamins is really helpful for helping um, these immune cells to do what they're supposed to be doing. Now, another couple um, supplements I want to mention that I have been um, incorporating into my own wellness um, this past year, one that I had not known much about until recently was in acetine in acetylcysteine. Um, it's sometimes referred to as NAC or NAC. It is a supplement form of the amino acid cysteine. 
and it increases the level of the antioxidant glutathione in the body. Now, there was this well-known study that you see there on the screen by an uh, Italian study published in the European Respiratory Journal, and it found that only 25% of the people who took 1,200 milligrams a day of NAC, which is like just two tablets, and then were injected with a flu virus, only 25% of those developed flu symptoms, compared with 79% who received a placebo. So that means only one out of four had symptoms, whereas three out of four got sick who didn't take it. So that means when you're going through your winter flu season, this could be a really important um, supplement you could take to help your body's defense system when it's flu season. You wouldn't want to necessarily take it all year long, but when there is a higher rate of infections and stuff going on, it could be helpful. Now let's look at a couple herbs um, that I have found to be very beneficial for um, immunity. This one, echinacea, is probably one that you are familiar with. Um, in this journal, in the journal Lancet Infectious Diseases, the University of Connecticut performed a meta-analysis study that evaluated the effect of echinacea using 14 studies. And in it, it determined that echinacea can reduce the chances of catching a common cold by 58% and that it reduces the duration of the common cold by almost one and a half days. Now, what I have read is that echinacea works best at the beginning stages of an illness when you're first beginning to feel symptoms. The reason being is that it's helping to stop the virus from replicating and shorting the duration and lessening the severity of it. But if you start, if you're taking it, um, start taking it once you're like full on sick, the virus is already in your cells and replicated. And at that point, the echinacea is not as beneficial. So it's best to take when you're first starting to feel ill. Another amazing uh, herb, or you could, maybe it's not necessarily an herb, I would maybe more classify it as a berry, <laughs> um, but that's elderberry. And the Journal of International Medical Research showed that when the extract is used within the first 48 hours of the onset of flu symptoms, it can shorten the duration of flu symptoms by an average of four days. Now, there are so many different studies on the benefits of elderberry syrup, um, and we will send you a couple links in the handout that you'll get tomorrow that you can research more on this. It's actually one of my favorite things to take when I'm starting to feel sick or just as maintenance um, to just keep my immune system up. And that's just because it tastes so good. And it's one that uh, children would really love as well. Um, but I think this past year, elderberry has kind of come under some criticism because of its strong immune boosting um, in relation to COVID. And that's because some have expressed concern that elderberry might produce um, too many cytokines, which we know in the late stages of COVID-19, you can have a cytokine storm, which cannot be good. So I have included a, a link for you from the School of Medicine and Public Health at the University of Madison, Wisconsin, that looks at this. And basically uh, what they said in this paper was that it would be better if you're going to take elderberry syrup to take it more at the very beginning of your COVID symptoms. And if your symptoms started progressively worse to discontinue use, um, because then you might be getting more to an inflammatory state where you could potentially have some problems. So that would be what I would do, but do your own research and make your own conclusions about elderberry syrup. Now, another herb is astragalus. This is one I learned about a couple of years ago when I went to an herbal class. Um, it is a root and it is a powerful immune booster. It's an anti-inflammatory, it's an aptogen, which means it helps balance, restore and protect your body from cortisol and stress. And because it also stimulates the production of interferon, studies are showing that astragalus has been used in the treatment of cancer because it slows or prevents the growth of tumors and it alleviates symptoms of chemotherapy. So if you know someone who has cancer or maybe you, are having, you have cancer, um, this would be one to definitely look into. There's some amazing studies about astragalus in relationship to tumors and um, 
chemotherapy. So I really um, like this one. I actually have it um, in a tablet form or a capsule form like this. I also have it in a powder form. Um, I use the powder form in like my smoothies. I just put like a half teaspoon um, in my smoothie and I'll do that, you know, maybe once or twice a week um, throughout the winter. And when my husband and I did this um, a couple of years ago, we did it pretty consistently. Neither of us got any illness that winter. And this was one of the main things we had done. So I think there is definitely some uh, benefit of it. So it might be one for you to look into. Now, the last part in our nutrition section here I want to um, share is a recipe with you that is a nature's flu shot. So this is a drink you make, and we're going to send you this recipe, and you can print it off and share a copy with someone else as well. Uh, basically, you just peel your lemons and I juice them. You can keep uh, just take the rind off of them and use the pulp, but I don't like the pulpier consistency. So I just juiced the lemons and then you blend it with your garlic, your ginger, some honey, and then pineapple juice. And once it's blended up really well, I strain it because again, I don't like any pulpiness in it. Um, and then that's a personal preference. And then you drink it like one cup, four times a day until your symptoms start feeling better. Or you can drink it um, more for maintenance um, throughout the winter, just to keep your immune system up. Now, we know that garlic and ginger especially are so good for immune system, but they're kind of hard to get down raw in large quantities, especially like if you look at the recipe, there's 12 cloves of garlic in there and you're like, whoa, that's a lot of garlic. <laughs> But when you blend it like this with the honey and the pineapple juice, it really isn't that bad. It's, and uh, Mary Lou is on here tonight and she just made some of this recently. She was telling me uh, she liked it. Um, and I have a, a friend of mine who recently had COVID. She was taking this and her husband <coughs> tried it and he said, no, I don't want any of it. So she was the only one who drank it. And she said their symptoms were about the same, but she got, well, a lot sooner than he did. But she said, I was the one who was drinking the flu shot drink. So who knows, maybe that made a difference. So I'll try this. And I have a note there that if you're diabetic, you could uh, substitute a tomato juice um, if you're concerned about the um, sugar increase. Okay, let's move on to our next one, which is exercise. Exercise is for E, it not only protects your immune system, but it also strengthen it, strengthens it. Um, regular brisk walking can bolster both the antibody response and the natural killer T cell response. It lowers body-wide inflammation, improves metabolic health, and it we know helps with stress and anxiety and mood and all those things too. And your mental state is really important for your immune health. So even though it's winter time, try, get outside if you can. I got out today, just bundled up, especially if it's sunny, try to get outside, go for a little walk or do some exercise inside, but don't just sit all winter. <clears throat> now let's talk about water. Uh, one of the benefits of drinking water is that adequate hydration has a huge impact on your immune system. Water helps all of your body systems function at optimum levels. Drinking plenty of water flushes toxins and ensures your cells are getting all the oxygen they need to function as they're designed. So if you're starting to come down sick, you wanna drink lots of water and keep drinking it until you're well because it will help flush. But there's another really amazing use of water for treating illness and it's hydrothermal therapy or the use of hot and cold water to raise your body core temperature and aid your body's innate immune system to fight virus. So I want to at this time um, show you the other video we were looking at there a moment ago that was on water. So let me just pull this back up. And some of the research as to why hydrothermal therapy is so helpful for your immune system. 
What I want to talk about and focus on is water. Water is a very interesting substance because out of all the substances that we have, it really holds heat the most. It has what we call a high ent enthalpy of heat. So what do we know about this? Well, let's go back to a German study in 2002 that I think should start us off. Let's look at the cellular biology. Here, they took about 12 healthy volunteers. And the only reason why they needed 12 is they didn't need to do much to get statistical significance. This is a pretty high activity here. They were immersed them in 39.5 degrees centigrade water. And what they noticed after that is that not only were there more monocytes, so increasing the body temperature increased the number of monocytes, but when they took those monocytes outside of their body and put them in to a test tube where they subjected them to lipopolysaccharide, which basically tells the cells that there's bacteria around, they were actually more active than they were when they weren't submerged in 39.5 degrees centigrade, which tells us that not only is it, it's not just a parlor trick where we're just getting more cells, we're actually seeing the cells activated. And so the authors of this study concluded that the thermal effect of fever directly activates monocytes, which increases their ability to respond to bacterial challenge. Remember, monocytes are part of that very important innate immune system. And what about, what about exposing to cold? So a lot of times in hydrothermal therapy, we will expose the person to cold after heat. This is what I'm reading. And it, what it does is instead of allowing the body to dissipate the heat through a vasodilated peripheral vasculature, it causes vasoconstriction to lock that heat in. So here is a paper that was published in Tor at the University of Toronto, but sponsored, interestingly, by the United States uh, military to see what would happen when people were subjected to cold after being in, in hot. And what they noticed is that the natural killer cells went up statistically significantly. The lytic units in the natural killer cells went up, lymphocytes, monocytes, all of them went up. And that was your innate immune system to the point where the authors concluded that this study suggests that despite popular beliefs that cold exposure can precipitate that, that despite the popular belief that cold exposure can precipitate a viral infection, the innate component of the immune system is not adversely affected by a brief period of cold exposure. Indeed, the opposite seems to be the case. The fall in core body temperature resulting from cold exposure led to a consistent and statistically significant mobilization of circulating cells and an increase in natural killer cells activity and elevations in IL-6. So I think that was, in, again, only seven subjects needed for this study because the effect was so profound. Here's a Polish study that looked at that. Apparently in Poland, they like to go swimming in the wintertime. Um, so they looked at that. We just looked at a study that looked at it over just one, one episode. What about if we do it multiple times? So at the end of a winter swimming season, they took people who like to do this, 12 habitual winter swimmers, and they looked at eight people that didn't do that. I can tell you that I would have been in that second category because I don't really see the, the need to go swimming in the winter time. But nevertheless, in the part that went swimming in the winter time, they had increased concentrations of leukocytes, monocytes, and plasma IL-6, and they were statistically significantly higher. And I can show you more and more studies, more than we have time for. Uh, but the question is, is, okay, so if we're heating people up, and it, we're, we're increasing the immune system. Isn't that going to cause more of a cytokine storm? Isn't that going to make people worse? Maybe we'll get them into the hospital faster than shorter. Well, I think this paper that was published about five years ago really answers that question. And what, there, what this uh, paper titled Fever and Thermal Regulation of Immunity, the Immune System Feels the Heat showed, was that fever actually can bring down the number of cytokines. Read to, listen to what they say in this paragraph. Although febrile temperatures initially increase the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines by macrophages at sites of inflammation, there's also evidence that thermal stress dampens cytokine synthesis once macrophages become activated. And they go on and talk about these monocyte-derived macrophages and how they look for these PAMPs, these, these molecular patterns to eat them up and present them. And it shows that the messenger RNA, which is the message that tells the cell to make the cytokines, is degraded by the fever, so you actually have less cytokines. Finally, they, they mention about a, a mouse model of collagen-induced arthritis. And they, they say here that mice exposed to fever range hyperthermia had significantly less joint damage, correlating with a reduction in serum tumor necrosis factor levels and an increased IL-10 production in inflamed joints. Collectively, they say this finding suggests that strategic, strategic 
temperature shifts contribute to a biochemical negative feedback loop that protects tissues against damage from excessive cytokine release following infection. Okay, so let's summarize here. Working hypotheses. Innate immunity can be strengthened, at least by surrogate markers, by manipulating external heat cold applied to the body. Number two, heating and cooling seems to increase markers of innate immunity, like natural killer cells and macrophages. And number three, these interventions don't necessarily seem to exacerbate the cytokine storm implicated in ARDS or pneumonia. All right, but what about real people and real diseases? Enough with the cells. Well, for that, we've got to go back to the last century. There's a famous psychiatrist, Julius Wagner Jorag, who noticed in his psych wards that people with neurosyphilis got better when they had a fever. Well, at that time, they didn't have penicillin. This was well before penicillin, but they did have quinine sulfate, which was the treatment for malaria. So we had this idea, what would happen if I infected these people with malaria? Very carefully watching them and then see if the fever treated the patient. Sure enough, it did. And in 1917, he published his first report where he actually induced an infection in a patient so he could get a fever. The fever... The increased temperature in the body cured the patient of neurosyphilis, and then he cured the patient of the malaria with the quinine sulfate. Um, he won the Nobel Prize for medicine for just that. And at the time, at that time, there was many ways that they could induce a fever. Malaria was just one of them, but as you can see, they would inject people with foreign protein, chemicals, sulfur, etc. But I find the last one here the most interesting immersion of the individual in a hot bath or placing him in a heat cabinet. Well, Dr. Wagner Jorag, as Dr. Nedley mentioned, had a colleague across the country in New England. Dr. Rubel was the medical director of the New England Sanitarium, which Dr. Nedley was talking to us about. And just to review those results again, he noticed that in the sanitarii or the sanitaria, the, ten, the overall mortality was about 1.3%, as opposed to the overall in the army camps of 6.4%. Now, this is where they were using aspirin. It had just come out in 1899. They were suppressing fevers. They Obviously, they were in big uh, tents. They were all crammed in. The air was not that clean. So why was, the, why was the mortality, again, lower in the sanitarium than it was in the Army hospital? It wasn't because they were doing a better job of treating pneumonia. No, indeed, their mortality rate for pneumonia was, was arguably higher than it was in the Army camp. It's because less people got pneumonia. So only 2.5% of the people in the sanitarium got pneumonia, whereas 17% of the people in the Army hospital got pneumonia. And at that time, before antibiotics, pneumonia was a bad, bad thing to have. By the way, Dr. Rubel, what did Dr. Rubel attribute his success to? And I think it's very interesting to read the last sentence in his write-up, which was published in Life and Health, May 1st, 1919. He says, the principal merits as far as treatment was concerned, was placed in careful nursing and hydrotherapeutic remedies. So there's many, many ways that you can raise a core body temperature as we've just sung. This is a example of a sauna. Here we see the tradition in Finland go on many years. We'll talk more about Finland, but you get hot. And as soon as you get hot, you jump into a very cold pool. What we believe this does is it clamps down the peripheral vasculature, keeps the heat in higher and longer. But what about, we've talked about people and we've talked about disease. Let's talk more about people and diseases and less about cells because that's where we really want to go. So here is a placebo, here's a, a randomized perspective trial, I should say, that went on for six months. Two groups, 25 in one group, 25 in the other group. The 25 in one group had a sauna bath similar to this one to two times a week. The control group did not. After about three months, there were half the number of colds in the sauna bathing group than there was in the control group. And this was statistically significant down to a P level of less than 0 0.01. And it wasn't in particular one or two people. It was across the board that brought that number down. So it seems as though this was applicable across the board. Here's another study. This, this was 3,000 subjects. And it was only over a month. And what they asked them to do was to, instead of just showering hot, is to shower hot and then cold at the end to keep that heat in and cause vasoconstriction. And what they noticed is in the intervention group, there was a 30% reduction in sick days at work. 30% reduction in sick days at work. In other words, they got sick, but it reduced the severity of it so they didn't have to miss work. That was a perspective study. This
And that's where that video is going to end. You can get the link to see the rest of it uh, later. But I want to go back here to um, our presentation for a second because I want to show you some of the different um, treatments that is being described here. So we're talking about hydrothermal therapy. And one of the things that he mentioned um, in that thing was about fevers. And we usually in our culture today think, oh, fever is a bad thing. I get a fever, I need to take a Tylenol, I need to um, take some ibuprofen. But really what it, a fever is, is it's the body's in response to an infection. It's the body trying to raise the internal temperature out of its normal home homeostatic range and to help speed up the body's response system to the infection. And at the same time, slow down the reproduction of the pathogen. So while a high fever could be dangerous, a low fever is good to let it run its course without taking an aspirin or ibuprofen. So you're not interfering with the body's immune system. But there are other ways that you can create that um, fever naturally. And the one he's talking about here that has been shown in the past to work so well is hydrothermal therapy or water treatments, which is the contrast between hot and cold water. And there are many different types of treatments that can be done at home. Um, we could do a whole class on that sometime, which I hope we can some, at some point. But there are three very simple ones I want to share with you. One is the contrast hot and cold shower. One is the hot bath. And the other one is the hot foot bath. And all these treatments raise your body's core temperature, naturally inducing a type of fever and then locking in the heat by ending with cold, thus boosting your white blood cell count. So let's just go first to look at um, the hot bath. This is one I shared with a friend of mine last night and she told me that she did this and that it was very helpful. So let me show this little short video to you. These are instructions on how you can have a hot tub bath in the comfort of your own home. Firstly, while the bathtub is running, drink some warm water to warm up your body. Then put some ice into a big bowl and pour some water into it. Have a hand towel ready to go. Prepare your bed because after this treatment, you want to immediately go and have a rest in it. Before going into the bathtub, make sure you go to the toilet so you do not have to go during the treatment. Put the bowl of ice next to the bathtub. Make sure your bathroom is nice and warm. Before getting into the bathtub, Make sure you check the temperature with your elbow. It should be just a bit hotter than you'd like it to be, but not too hot that it burns your skin. It is now time to get into the bathtub. Because we are mainly trying to treat the chest, make sure you can get the chest under the water as much as possible. Make sure you keep your head out of the water and keep your head cool. Keep your head cool by placing the cold towel onto your forehead or over your face. You may also use a pillow to keep your head comfortable. Make sure you have a watch or a timing device because you want to be in the bathtub no longer than 20 minutes. While you're in the bathtub, you may find yourself getting sweaty and this is good. Keep using the hand towel on your forehead to keep your head cool. After the 20 minutes is done, you want to let out the water and stay in the bathtub. While in the bathtub, you want to use that hand towel and wipe down your limbs. This is called cold mitten friction. The hand towel will be very cold on your limbs. However, what's coming next will be more of a shock. You want to pour the remaining of the ice cold water onto your chest and onto your back. This will definitely be a shock to your system, but it will be very, very refreshing. <laughs> Slowly get up from the bathtub. You don't want to go too quick because you may be lightheaded. Dry yourself off and then immediately go to bed. 
you need to rest for at least half an hour minimum to get your body back to normal equilibrium. Or you can sleep for the night. I hope these instructions have been helpful for you. Okay, now I could see some of you guys were like, like, oh my, I'm going to be putting that ice water <laughs> over myself when I'm done. But the whole point here is that when you've done this hot bath and your body core temperature is really warm, actually the cold does feel pretty good at that point. And it's sealing all of that heat in, which is what you want to have happen so that it can continue to fight the infection. Going to bed right afterwards is really good because then your body's coming back to that homeostasis point and you're gonna feel so much better the next morning. Uh, my husband had uh, was very sick over the holidays. He actually got COVID and he did this treatment. I think we did this almost every day and it worked amazing for him. He loved it. Um, I know this one is a real powerful one. So this is a great one to try. Okay, you know, I just wanna, yes. um, I did this last night. Actually, I did it at about eight last night and then I did it again at two this morning. Um, and my body temperature going in was at about 90, 97.3 and, um, coming out of it, it was a hundred point four. So it really does raise your body temperature up. And like Stacy said, that cold water, you just dread it because you know how cold it is, but it actually feels pretty good. Yeah. Um, so, and when we're done with this, I'm going to go do it again. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So that's great to get a uh, testimony from someone who's just done it. Now, the next one I'm going to show you is the contrast shower. And with this one, I think this one works best uh, more for maintenance. Like if you did this a couple times a week, it will really boost your white blood cell count just to help you not to get sick. Um, or if you're just starting to feel like you're starting to come down with something uh, before you've gotten like the fever and rural chills, I think this one works really great for that. And it's easy to do because you take showers all the time. So let me show you how this one is done. In this segment, I will discuss the contrast shower. The definition of the contrast shower is a series of hot showers between 102 and 110 degrees Fahrenheit, altered by cold showers, 55 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit, with the hot segment lasting longer than the cold segment. Here are the effects of the contrast shower. We will be stimulating the thermal receptors or the hot and cold receptors in the body which is going to vastly increase the circulation throughout the body. Stimulating the body as it tries to throw off heat during the hot phase and conserving heat during the cold phase. This again is going to strongly increase the circulation. The immunity will be increased by those white blood cells circulating through the circulatory system. The mechanical receptors in the skin are stimulated by the pressure from the shower. So this increases the person's ability to sense or feel. Here are the indications or the conditions for receiving a contrast shower. Stimulating blood flow to the skin, thereby relieving congestion of internal organs. Lethargy or fatigue. It serves as a tonic or it helps to tone the skin, vessels underneath and the muscles. This can prevent soreness after vigorous exercise or work, prevent development of a migraine headache if you do this quick enough, prevent the onset of respiratory cold or flu, or shorten the duration of respiratory cold or flu, develop better tolerance to cold winter weather, advanced diabetes. So here are some cautions for the contrast showers. So this means that you wouldn't use this in the typical protocol, but just maybe back off on the temperature or do it just a little bit differently. And I will explain that. 
for advanced diabetes, you only want to use 20 degrees difference in temperature. So if you have the hot at 102 degrees, the cold will go down to 82. Loss of sensation. Again, the same thing. Use only 20 degrees difference in temperature. Pregnancy. Again, only 20 degrees difference in temperature. Hyperthyroidism. People that suffer with hyperthyroidism should not too frequently receive these showers. Thyroid is already overactive. The inability to tolerate heat or cold use less extreme temperature. So the contraindications or conditions that you would not want to do this treatment. Lymphedema due to disease or surgery. Advanced cardiovascular disease. Advanced renal or kidney disease, multiple sclerosis, seizure disorders, extreme obesity, a recent meal, you want to wait at least one hour, a chilled person, ingestion of alcohol or illegal drugs. Here's the equipment that you need for the contrast shower. Obviously a shower stall, hot and cold water, a thermometer, a container to measure the temperature of the water, a bath towel, a bath mat. You may need to have grab bars on the sides for people that are unsteady to hang on to. A body brush or a loofah sponge for extra mechanical stimulation if desired. This will make the treatment more intense. And a time device. Here's the procedure of how to give a contrast shower. Check the health history and clear for cautions or contraindications and consent to treat for the person. Take vital signs and explain the treatment to your subject. Have the client undress to their bathing suit. Place the bath mat on the floor in front of the shower. Turn on the water in the shower using the thermometer to adjust the hot water temperature to the desired level for your subject. Have your subject enter the hot shower and remain for three to five minutes until thoroughly warm. Change the water to cold using the thermometer to check the temperature for the desired level. Remain in the cold for 30 seconds, no longer than one minute. Change the water back to hot for three minutes, checking the temperature. Change the water back to cold for 30 to 60 seconds, checking the temperature. And then you can repeat those above steps between the hot and the cold for a minimum of three cycles or longer, depending on the desire of the effect for your client. After the last cycle of cold, turn off the water as the client steps out onto the bath mat. Have the client thoroughly towel dry briskly. Have the client dress to stay warm. Retake vital signs and record the treatment. Now, I will say that that video was designed a little bit more in the context where you would be having a uh, therapy, you know, you're doing it for someone else. Um, when you're doing it for yourself, you don't necessarily have to go quite through all that detail. But it's the same idea. And I wanted to show you that video because it did show when you should or should not do it. Or if you have diabetes, for example, not having the temperature extremes um, too great. Now, this um, treatment is really amazing. Um, I will be honest in just sharing my own uh, experience. When I do this a couple times a week, and when we were fighting illness, I was doing that even more frequently, like every time I took a shower. But I have to tell you that the first time going to the cold is really cold, okay? And you like, I can't do 30 seconds of the cold the first time. <laughs> Cause I'm just like, ah, you know, they're like screaming and whatever. So I can only like go over to the cold for a little bit, not like all the way over to the cold. And I'm spinning around and I'm screaming and like maybe after 10 seconds, I have to go back to the hot. Um, and then you get really hot again. And, and you're going, you're not doing just like a normal hot at this point. You're like, want it hot, you know, so that you're really warming your core temperature. And then when I went back to the cold the second time, 
it didn't feel so cold. And I was able to like do the whole 20, 30 seconds, you know? And then I went back to the hot and now I'm like getting really hot because what's happening is now all that heat is really building up. There's something about the cold that just like puts the heat up inside of you. Um, so that by like the third time, the cold is actually feeling really great by now. And then when you end with the cold, and you step out of the shower to grab your towel, you're like warm. You don't, you don't think you'd be that warm, but you are really warm. And whatever chill you might've had is long gone. So that's my personal experience. Um, you test it yourself, but the white blood cells go up so significantly after this contrast shower that it's an amazing thing. I, Dr. Uh, Schwelt, who um, you've been watching, he as a, um, COVID doctor, when he comes home from the hospital after he's been on a shift with patients, he says in his own protocol, I go take a hot and cold contrast shower right away. That's one of the things he's doing to help keep himself from getting sick. And I think there's a lot of benefit to that too. Now, the other treatment um, is a hot foot bath. And because of time, I think I'm going to skip this one because <laughs> um, we're going a little bit longer. But I'm going to include a link to it in the handout I send out. Um, the hot foot bath is really good if you've got a headache, if you've got sinus congestion, if you're dealing with chest congestion, menstrual cramps, anything where there's congestion in the body um, is really good. I had a bad headache a couple weeks ago, and this hot foot bath just like make that headache go away. Um, so it's a really easy one to do, and I'll send you um, a video to show you how to do it. Um, Stacy, I'm just wondering though, is at the same time like three minutes with the hot and the minute? And no, no, it's not. It's not back and forth like with the shower. It's more like with the tub bath, where you're in the heat for like your 20 minutes, and then you end with cold water over your feet. Yeah, more like the the bath. Good question. Okay. I uh, just wanted to add my experience and it is, it's pretty daunting the first time that you do it, but once you get used to the system, it really feels good. Yeah. And like you said, you know, the tendency is, oh, I need to just crank it all the way cold the first, you know, and, but you don't just do what you can do. But the, by the time you hit the third time, it really feels good and it's refreshing. And um, the other thing I wanted to bring up too is when the, the hot bath, the things that I have watched is that it, you don't want your temperature to go above 102. That's really kind of the goal is 102 uh, mm -hmm. to induce a fever. But that's why you keep the cold rag on your head is you don't want your nervous system to be um, affected. You, you want to keep your uh, your, your uh, final, you know, just everything, you know, like your, your head and everything cool. So. Yeah, um, you don't want to pass out, <laughs> which you could if your head got too hot and you just wouldn't be very comfortable. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing because it seems so just way too simple. Like how can this actually work? But it's these things that God has given us that are so simple so simple and it's really neat that science is catching up to it <laughs> absolutely and it's cheap and everybody can do it and that's what we need right now is we need ways that people can get healthy without having to just rely on the emergency room you know we were in situations this year where there was concerns emergency rooms would be too full you know and you might not be able to get care so we need to find ways that we can help ourselves at home um, and try to help our doctors and nurses out in that way. So let's look at the next acronym, uh, letter in our acronym. We are at new start. We've covered the new. We're going to quickly go through the next five. The first one here is sunshine. And this is where we talk about vitamin D, which is why I didn't mention it when we were talking about vitamins earlier. Vitamin D and the immune system, there's so many studies that have been done on this. And in this paper, it says vitamin D can modulate the innate and adaptive immune responses and deficiency in vitamin D is associated with increased autoimmunity as well as an increased susceptibility to infection. Uh, there is a study that was done by the British Medical Journal in 2017 
that um, looked at how vitamin D prevents acute respiratory tract infections, which is one of the main causes of people going to oh, hospital, getting very sick. And in this study, they looked at 11,000 people um, from 15 different countries, and they found that when they were, had, were taking daily or weekly um, supplements of vitamin D, the risk of them having an acute respiratory infection was reduced from 60% down to 32%. So amazing things there about it related to um, respiratory. Now, a fascinating, um, more of a association study that came out just last year related to COVID. This was a massive study. They looked at 200,000 Americans from all 50 states. They were looking at their vitamin D levels and how many of them tested positive for COVID-19. And what they found was that there was an inverse relationship between SARS-CoV-2 mm -hmm. and vitamin D. So you can see in the chart where it, the graph kind of goes from high down to low. So what is down at the bottom is where their vitamin D level is. When it was like going below 50, down to like 40, 30, or 20, then the rate of catching, um, of getting testing positive for COVID-19 was going up. So lower vitamin D levels, more likely to get COVID. And the amazing thing about this study is that there are lots of charts that they show in it. They show by geographical location, like in the northern part of the country or the southern part of the country, by age, by race, by gender, and in all cases, without exception, lower vitamin D meant higher COVID positivity. So what I want to just say here about vitamin D, and there's so much on this, you can look at it in some of the stuff we're sending you, but if you don't know what your vitamin D levels are, you should get them tested um, so that you can know and then take supplementation if they're not in the high enough range. Because we do know now very clearly that vitamin D is helping people to get through COVID better or keep them from getting COVID. So you wanna make sure you are at the right level. So talk with your doctor about that. And the next letter is T and this is for temperance. And by temperance, we mean abstemiousness, which is either moderation or avoidance of what is harmful. And as we've already said, a diet that's high in animal fat and refined sugars and fried foods, um, these are increasing your free radical damage and inflammation and putting your body in a state where disease can take over. So we want to eliminate those fried foods and meats and, and we want to try to avoid sugar. So let's talk at sugar here for a moment. This was a fascinating study that came out a long time ago, actually in 1973, by the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And it showed that sugar affects the function of white blood cells for up to five hours after you consume sugar. So that means if you're eating foods with sugar throughout your day, your immune system can be in a compromised, suppressed state that whole time because for five hours after you eat it, your immune system is weakened. Um, Dr. Agatha Thrash, who's an MD, has said another important fact about sugar has to do with disease resistance. The white blood cells with segmented nuclei increase in numbers in the bloodstream when the body has a bacterial infection. These cells destroy bacteria. They are the body's soldiers. However, when the blood sugar levels go up, these cells get sluggish and cannot destroy as many bacteria. Six teaspoons of sugar, which is the amount of sugar in a single candy bar, reduces the ability of these white blood cells to destroy unfriendly bacteria by 25%. 12 teaspoons, the amount of sugar in a single can of soda pop, reduces the ability of your white blood cells to destroy unfriendly bacteria by 60%. And 24 teaspoons, which is just half of the average daily intake of refined sugar, can reduce the ability of your white blood cells to destroy these bacteria by 92%. Wow. So if we're eating a lot of sugar in our diet and it's in so many different foods, you may not even realize how much you're taking in but you could be in a compromised immune state just because of the sugar. So try to remove refined sugars from your diet. The next letter in our acronym is A, which stands for air. And fresh air is so important to help get rid of the toxins that are in your lungs, getting those fresh 
deep breaths, um, deep breaths in there. You might want to even check out some videos on how to do deep breathing exercises. Uh, my mom was very sick earlier this year. She had that shortness of breath. Um, she found these deep breathing exercises really help oxygen deep into her lungs. So there's also some interesting study about getting out into the forest. Here was a study called Forest Bathing Enhances Human Natural Killer Cell Activity and Expression of Anti-Cancer Proteins. So in this study that was done in Japan, they took 12 healthy men, took them into the forest on day one, measured their blood. The next day, they took them into the forest in the morning and the afternoon. And then the following day, the third day, they went back to the city. And they took their blood again and found that their natural killer cell numbers and activity and concentration had greatly improved. And that their, these natural killer cells actually were high for the next seven days. And this is just incredible. Like God has created so many beautiful things outside. If we get out for a walk in the park or go out to uh, uh, just go for a walk in your neighborhood, if there's some trees and, and nature and breathing in that fresh air, it helps your body produce natural killer cells. I just think that's so incredible. Now we want to just look briefly at sleep or rest. Sleep and immunity. It's recommended that you should get eight hours of sleep per night and to go to bed early because it's during stages three and four of sleep, which is slow wave sleep, that your brain is resting and your body healing and repairing. Now we go into these deeper levels of sleep earlier and for longer periods in the hours before midnight. After midnight, we have more REM sleep. So that's when you're kind of waking up or you're dreaming a lot. But those early hours before midnight is when your body is actually healing and repairing. So that is when you should get go to bed so that you're helping your immune system. Research shows that if you lose about three hours of sleep, that you actually decrease your immune function by 50%. And you might have just seen in your own life that you knew you hadn't gotten much sleep recently and then you came down sick. And it's because your immune system was struggling because of that lack of sleep. So if you are feeling sick, you're starting to feel like you're coming down with something, you need more sleep. Don't stay up late watching TV. That's just very mentally stimulating. Go to bed, get a good night's rest. But it's, just, it's not just a nightly rest we need. God says we also need a weekly rest. And that's why in the 10 commandments, God said in Exodus 28 through 10, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it, you shall do no work. You see our creator, when he finished completing the work of creation on the seventh day, he rested. And he gave that to us as a gift because we also need to be able to rest physically, mentally, and spiritually with our creator. And so for me, I have found that the weekly Sabbath rest really helps me to feel better, to feel rejuvenated, and I love it. I look forward to the Sabbath rest every Saturday. So if you want to learn more about the Sabbath rest, um, you can go to uh, my favorite website that talks about the Sabbath, has tons of resources, is sabbathtruth.com. So check that out, sabbathtruth.com. You can learn a lot about God's weekly Sabbath rest there. And the last letter in our acronym of New Start, our last eighth doctor of immune health is trust in God. And I believe this is the most important of them all. You see, the truth is your immune system was designed by our creator God and he alone knows how to make it function properly. And he alone can truly protect us. When I was thinking about um, how our immune system protects us, I thought of this verse in Isaiah 59, 19, which says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. You see, Jesus is far more amazing and powerful than your immune system. So ask yourself, what is the enemy that's trying to take you down? Is it stress at work or home? Is it anxiety? or worry or depression? Is there some unresolved conflict in your life? Or maybe you're just fighting an illness that has just been wearing you down. What enemy is trying to take you down? Whatever that threat is, 
God wants to protect you physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, if you will just trust in him. In Psalm 18 too, I love this verse. It says, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength and whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Jesus wants to be your protector, defender, shield, your fortress. He's like your immune system, but even better. And no attack by the enemy can harm you when you are safe in his arms. So I want to just encourage you to give it all to him in prayer and he will fight for you. And if you do get sick, you can claim this promise in Psalm 41.3. The Lord will strengthen him on his bed of illness. You will sustain him on his sick bed. You don't need to be alone when you're sick. The Lord will sustain you if you ask him. So in conclusion, as we've looked at these eight doctors of immune health, I just have a little slide here that says, I'm starting to feel sick. What do I do? Uh, this is what I ask myself every time I get um, that itch in my throat. And here's the important thing you need to know. You need to recognize when you're coming down sick. If, you, if you're healthy most of the time, you should know when something doesn't feel right. Maybe it's that scratchy throat or you're getting a, you wake up with a sore throat. Maybe you're feeling extra tired. Uh, maybe you have that just general achy feeling um, or a headache is coming on and you're like, uh-oh, feel like I'm coming down with something. That is your signal to do something quick because the virus is going to start replicating really fast. And if you hit it hard within those first 24 hours, in many cases, you'll just feel better than it. And it'll just all go away. If you ignore those signals, you could be sick for several days or in the case of COVID, maybe a couple weeks, you know, so try to hit it fast. So here, just when you start feeling sick, just think of that acronym New Start, those eight doctors of immune health, nutrition. Am I eating antioxidant rich foods, immune boosting foods? Just start tanking up on those uh, foods. Um, take your vitamins, take your vitamin C, take those herbs, um, those supplements, have those things ready in your house. So that moment you just start, just, just start taking one of everything. That's what I usually do. <laughs> um, just start getting extra support to my immune system at that moment. Make that flu tonic drink and start drinking that. Give yourself some support. Um, exercise, get out and do a gentle walk. Now, here's the thing, when you're coming down sick, doing a very intense workout could maybe actually wear your body down. So be light on your fitness at that time. Just a simple walk, um, do something gentle. Drink extra water, do a hydrotherapy treatment, especially try to do one before you go to bed um, so that you sleep after you have that. Take some extra vitamin D. Avoid all sugar and processed foods. Breathe in some fresh air outside or open a window maybe in your bedroom so you get some fresh air as you go to bed. Go to bed early, get some extra sleep. And then finally, trust in God. Claim his promises in his word. Give your anxiety to God. If you follow this just simple eight doctors of immune health, I think many times we can avoid um, illness. And when we're starting to come down sick, we can quickly reverse it. At least that has been um, a help to me. So I want to leave you guys with this um, scripture. This was a prayer that John prayed. And uh, it's one I want to pray for each of you. I pray you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. That's what I want you to experience is physical health as well as spiritual health. So um, in conclusion here, um, just wanted to review what we have coming up next um, before we have a, a, some closing comments or thoughts and, and a prayer. Um, our next event that we're gonna have is in two weeks from tonight. This will be February 25th at 7.30. And this is just an informal meet and greet and get to know each other. Um, and also look at some Bible verses that talk about health. Um, so it's just a very informal thing. It's more relaxed. We get to actually get to know each other and uh, read us a couple of scriptures, um, support each other in our own health journeys, fellowship. So I encourage you to come and join us. It's on the same Zoom that we're using tonight. So you don't even have to RSVP, you can just show up. 
And then a month from now on March 11 will be our next cooking class, which is interactive. As I said in the beginning, we can all be cooking at the same time. We're gonna be making this red lentil curry soup and a salad to go with it. So we'll be sending out those recipes to anyone who wants to um, attend that class. So put that on your calendar and let us know if you wanna come. So that concludes our presentation on immune health. And um, I'm open for someone to make a comment or ask a question. Hopefully I would know the answer if now <laughs> direct you to something. But um, any thoughts as we're finishing here this evening? Was this helpful? Did you learn something? Maybe you learned way too much. <laughs> Your head is spinning, but anyone have a comment? Yes, this was great. I'm going to try the hydrotherapy <laughs> treatments because I have a little cold coming on. So I'm definitely going to try that. Oh, so this is perfect timing for you. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, thanks, Stacey. Um, this actually reinforced, um, oops, hold on, don't let me click on the wrong thing, reinforced a lot of the things I've already been reading because uh -huh. I'm sitting on the fence about the COVID shot. Yeah. I really don't want to get it. So, um, you know, this just kind of reinforces other things that I've read and what you've been teaching us the last few months in cooking class and mm -hmm. what I had started learning from Anna or Hannah back, you know, a couple years yeah. ago when you guys started this at the church. Right. So, thank you for your time and the energy that you put into it. Thank you. And, you know, and there was a lot of reading and research I did, but I wanted to know it for myself too. And this just kind of like motivated me to um, do all this reading and watching these videos and, and just learning because I think that we all need to know how to take care of our own health. And it's more important now than ever for us to research and learn and then share what we learn with, with others because COVID has been bad, but there could be something coming down the pipe in the future that might be way worse, you know? And if our healthcare system gets overwhelmed, uh, where are people going to turn if they know some of the simple remedies they can do at home? We could maybe save some lives. And that's what I would hope would come from this. Stacy, can you get these black elderberry syrup at a health store or do you order it online? How do uh, you get these? Yeah, elderberry syrup can be found at any um, health food store and you can even find it at your Walmart or Meyer and the pharmacy. Okay, thank you. I thought it was great. Yeah, everything that um, we've talked about, all those things are very easy to, to come by. Well, we're going to be sending you, um, like I said, a handout that has links to all these things we've talked about so you can go do some further reading and research um, or watch those videos again <laughs> and share them. And I just wanna thank you for having spent um, this evening with me. Um, I wanna encourage you to come to our next classes and uh, check out our YouTube channel. Um, look for our New Beginnings Health Team. You can watch our last cooking classes we did um, and catch up on some of the things that we've already shared on immune health. So um, just put a New Beginnings Health Team and search for that on YouTube and you can find that. Um, we also have a Facebook page, New Beginnings Health Team. So like our page, then you'll get notified when we post things. So. Let's uh, have a prayer together and then we will close for tonight. God, I want to thank you so much for the time that we got to spend together. I wish we had more time to just visit and chat. And I guess that's why we are doing um, that meet greet thing in two weeks so that we have a little bit more informal time to get to know each other and encourage each other in our health journey. And I'm just so thankful for the way you have designed our body to be able to fight off um, illnesses, viruses, bacteria, all those things. It's just an amazing um, system you have created for us, uh, but we need to be taking good care of it. And so I pray that we can know how to do this with the information we've learned tonight, to have the wisdom to know what to do when we're starting to feel sick and to be um, responsible in our health. And Lord, we pray most of all that when we're, when we're just facing attacks in other areas of our life, um, emotionally and just mentally and spiritually, relationships that are under attack, that we could just run to you and find support in you. You want to be um, our protector, our defender, and fight off whatever invaders are coming into our life. Lord, thank you so much that you uh, promised to be that for us. 
bless each of my friends here, Lord. Thank you so much that you got to spend this evening with me. Put a special blessing over them. Keep them healthy. Keep their families well. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad you came tonight. Come again. We'll talk. All right. Send me a message. Okay. Thanks. I love okay. that. Okay. Thanks so much. You did a great job. Oh, thanks, Dorothy. I'm so glad you came. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you and bye-bye. See you next time. All right. See you next time, too. All right. That's one of my guests. Oh, wonderful. I'm so glad yeah. you invited Leslie. <laughs> yes. Well, I came, too. <laughs> I really want to do better. I want my immune system built up. Um, rather than trust man. I don't want to put any confidence in the flesh and take anything that doesn't need to be in my body that he didn't ordain. Amen. I understand. Amen. Yeah. You all put this to practice. I think you'll find success. The Lord will help you. He'll guide you. Thank you. Bye-bye. You Bye. too. Take care, Bye. Leslie. Thank you, Stacey. It was awesome. Oh, thank you, Lupe. So glad you could be here. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. Oh, good. And Laura, Beth, and Brooke, glad you guys could come on again. I always love seeing your smiling faces. Thank you. Thanks, Stacey. We'll see you soon. All right, you too.